we gather here this afternoon to give thanks to God for the life of Mr. Crawford Bell. You have no need for me to tell you that he was one of nature's gentlemen, a gentleman in both senses of the word, gentle in his manner and in his disposition, and a gentleman in his politeness and his consideration of others. We give thanks to God for a singer with a velvet voice, a vocalist, a musician, a trumpet player, a guitarist, a recording engineer, and much, much more. And yet with it all, a humble man. We give thanks to God for a devoted husband, a good father, a kindly father-in-law, and grandfather, and brother, and a friend to many. We also, of course, gather here that we may offer our sympathy and give support to Crawford's wife, Hazel, to his sons, Owen and Warren, to his grandchildren, Sophia, Caitlin, Grace, and Elliot, and also to his brother, Sloan. So, whether you have come here today from near or far, on behalf of the family circle, we do thank you for coming. The fact that so many have gathered, which is no surprise to us, I may say, but the fact that so many have gathered is an indication of how widely known Crawford was and the esteem in which he was held. So I know that your presence will bring an additional measure of comfort to the sorrowing family circle. So we gather to give thanks for his life. We gather to give our support to the sorrowing family circle. And of course, we also gather here that we may seek the face and grace of God, a God who creates us and who cares for us, who journeys with us along life's pathway and who gave the best he had, his only begotten son, for us and for our salvation. So just as we're very conscious of the presence of each other in this service of thanksgiving this afternoon, may we also know and may we also sense that there is another amongst us too, the risen Lord. He is here to comfort. He is here to strengthen. He is here to bless. He is here to challenge all of us about our relationship with God. So may we sense the presence of the Lord and hear his voice speaking to us. And may he the Lord Jesus be exalted in our midst. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The hymns that we are going to sing in this service this afternoon were amongst Crawford's favorite hymns. And this first hymn tells us of the love of Jesus and of what he did for us on the old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. Let's praise God together. Please stand in readiness to sing.
please be seated. Let us join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. O Lord our God, we still our hearts before the majesty of your presence, and we approach you in and through that name which is above every other name, the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. We approach you, O God, in worship and adoration because you are God. You are the creator of the ends of the earth and therefore our creator too. And not only have you created us, but you have provided for our every need along life's journey. You're the one who surrounds us from our earliest days with countless gifts of love. And for all the blessings that come from your bountiful hand, we give you thanks and praise, O God. You're the one who provides not only for the needs of our body, but for the needs of our precious souls as well. And in order to do so, we thank you that you sent your Son, the Lord Jesus, from the realms of glory down into this sin-scarred world. We thank you that he came in great humility as a little babe to the crib in Bethlehem. We thank you for the life of service that he gave when he was here on earth. And we thank you that he took his flawless life to the old rugged cross and there laid it down for flawed people like us. And we rejoice to know that there on that old rugged cross he bore our sin and shame and paid the penalty that we deserved. And we thank you that he died in our place instead. We rejoice to know that the grave could not hold him, that he rose victorious from the tomb on that first Easter day, that he gave many infallible proofs to his disciples that he was indeed risen and alive. And Lord, it is this Easter message that brings comfort to our hearts even on a day such as this, to know that our Redeemer liveth and will ever live. And Heavenly Father, we pray that therefore we may be conscious of his presence amongst us here in this service of thanksgiving this afternoon. Lord, we pray that you would draw near to the family circle. We pray that you would comfort them and that this service may bring an additional measure of strength to their aching hearts. But Lord God, you know each one of us. You know us by name. You know us by our needs. You know how we stand in relation to you. So according to our different requirements, we pray that you would minister to us as we share in this service, as we think about Crawford's life and the man that he was and the talents that he had. May this service uh, somewhat reflect all of that. And we pray, O oh God, that we may be led to the feet of the Redeemer, the Lord Jesus, and that our hearts would be drawn irresistibly to him. So be with us in our time together, we pray, and we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to have a variety of contributions um, in this service this afternoon. And first of all, Manda McConville, who is Crawford's niece, is going to now read a poem entitled, Do Not Stand at My Grave and Weep. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. I am a thousand winds that blow. I am the diamond glint on snow. I am the sunlight on ripened grain. I am the gentle autumn rain. When you wake in the morning hush, I am the swift uplifting rush of quiet birds in circling flight. 
I am the soft starlight at night. Do not stand at my grave and weep. I am not there. I do not sleep. Do not stand at my grave and cry. I am not there. I did not die. Trina and Leon uh, did backing vocals uh, for Crawford in his studio work and also on stage. And they are now going to come and they are going to sing um, two of the spiritual pieces that Crawford often sang. Jesus, the old lamp lighter, and Jesus, tender shepherd, hear me. And they are going to be accompanied, I understand, by Graham Murphy on the piano and Jim McVeigh on the accordion.
sincere thanks to Trina and Leon. Thank you. The family circle have asked me to read um, a poem entitled He is Gone. You can shed tears that he is gone or you can smile because he has lived. You can close your eyes and pray that he will come back or you can open your eyes and see all he has left. Your heart can be empty because you can't see him, or you can be full of the love you shared. You can turn your back on tomorrow and live yesterday, or you can be happy for tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember only that he is gone or you can cherish his memory and let it live on. You can cry and close your mind, be empty and turn back or you can do what he would want, smile, open your eyes, love and go on. Words about our dad are now going to be brought to us by Owen and Warren. There's a lot of superhero films about where men and women save the universe, and they're all well and good, but none of them are set and carried off. At least, not as far as I know. But what I do know is my dad lived his life at 31 Hillsborough Road with strength and dignity, love and kindness, music, joy and laughter. And he did this every day. So he didn't need to pop on some lycra or a big red cape or fly about in the sky to show us the path. Sure, he would have said no to the light gray anyway. <laughs> so thank you, Dad, for everything you've done and everything that you are. Because that's the kind of person I want to be. And I want my children to be. And their children after that. And I think that's heroic. And I'll carry that in my heart, always. Right. Um, as one of Dad's favourite songwriters, Ron McCraw, once wrote, this ain't no time for lengthy speeches, so I'm going to try and keep it brief. What made Dad a great dad was the fact he was a lovely person. He was a wonderful example of how to treat people with respect, kindness, patience, and compassion. And I hope I can live up to that example. But on top of that, he gave us the gift of music. I really can't begin to describe how important that is to me and how being surrounded by his love of music my whole life has given me such joy. His family's incredibly proud of his talents and his achievements, but more than that, of the positive influence he was. He had such generosity of time and spirit encouraging anyone and everyone with an interest in music, no matter what their ability or experience. In Carrie Duff, I know he certainly nurtured some less than stellar talent, allowing me and my friends free reign in his beloved studio. I know his head must have been in his hands half the time as we inadvertently blew speakers, broke strings, and connected everything up wrong. In fact, I know some of the culprits are, are about here today. But still, he always kept the doors of the studio open for us. Decency, decency, laughter, kindness, loyalty, music, stories, creativity, love, and family. He's left me a huge legacy, and I'll be forever grateful for that. 
Um, I'll just leave you with some words from one of Dad's favourite songs, which I think are very apt. I have no worldly goods to pass along. All I can give you is a passing song. No building's name for me. Just last, just lasting harmony. I give you music. Thank you, Dad. I love you. Thank you to Owen and to Warren for um, those memories and those reflections on your dad. Now we're going to hear two passages of scripture read. The first is uh, Psalm 150, which will be read by Joy Bell, Crawford's sister-in-law. And needless to say, um, it, it tells us about the variety of instruments that can be used in the praise of Almighty God, some of which um, Crawford was familiar with. Then after that, we'll hear the words of John chapter 8 and verse 12 and Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 4 and verses 22 to 27, which will be read by Rosie Thompson, Crawford's niece. Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his temple. Praise his strength in heaven. Praise him for the mighty things he has done. Praise his supreme greatness. Praise him with trumpets. Praise him with harps and lyres. Praise him with drums and dancing. Praise him with harps and flutes. Praise him with cymbals. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise the Lord, all living creatures. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> John chapter 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And from Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. I did not see a temple in the city, because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light. The Lamb is its light lamp. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their splendour into it. On no day will its gates ever be shut, for there will be no night there. The glory and honour of the nations will be brought into it. Nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Amen. Crawford Bell was born on the 29th of May 1943 in Agincourt Avenue, Belfast, and passed away last Thursday night at the age of 80. He was one of a family of six. He was educated at Botanic Primary School and then in the Technical College in Belfast. After that, he served an apprenticeship in coach building. He then worked for a while in an electric shop and then as a rep for a paints and equipment company. 
Crawford's first introduction to the world of music was playing the bugle at the Boys Brigade in Fitzroy Presbyterian Church. His older brother, Jim, um, already played in a concert band, and Jim noted Crawford's flair on the bugle, and so he bought Crawford a trumpet. He bought him the trumpet and gave it to him on the Tuesday. He noticed how quickly Crawford took to the trumpet. He took to it like duck to a duck to water. And so he said, Jim said to Crawford, right, you're in the band on Friday night. <laughs> that was um, Crawford's introduction to the band scene, you might say. And in a sense, the rest is history. He proceeded to manage a music shop in Belfast. He went professional playing with a country band called the California Breakmen. So more and more doors of opportunity opened up for him. By night, he would be playing and gigging in many places. By day, he worked in, first of all, in other recording studios and then opened his own recording studio in 1988. And in that capacity, he provided help to lots of artists. So he was a recording engineer by day and a musician and singer by night. He was a busy man. And that was true, of course, of him for so much of his life. Crawford's talents and willingness took him to many places and enabled him to assist and bring pleasure and blessing to many people. He sang in church halls, in orange halls, in community halls, in residential homes. Wherever he was requested, he went out of his way to make himself available. He toured with the Donaghadee Male Voice Choir in Canada and America. He did a lot of backing vocals and played for various artists like Daniel O'Donnell and Van Morrison and toured various parts of the world with them. Hugo Duncan was a longtime friend and associate of Crawford's and he often featured Crawford's songs in his um, country and western radio program in the afternoons. And Hugo paid a tribute to Crawford last Friday afternoon, saying that he thought Crawford would already, would already be putting a band together in heaven. <laughs> we can certainly say that Crawford has joined the band of the redeemed. He was always generous, Crawford was always generous with his time and with his willingness to help others. And of course, his contribution to wider society was um, noted and rightly recognized when he was awarded the MBE at Hillsborough Castle uh, last autumn. And the citation was for services to the music industry. Crawford was first diagnosed with bowel cancer in 2011. Following surgery for that, he made a wonderful recovery, and he was cancer-free until 2019. Then, unfortunately, the cancer returned and affected one of his lungs. And you can understand straight away how challenging that was for a man who was a singer and a man who was a trumpet player to boot. And then, unfortunately, the cancer spread elsewhere. However, Crawford showed great courage and resilience in the face of adversity. He kept going as best he, as he could, still playing, still 
singing, still entertaining when requested, because he was the kind of man who couldn't say no. And as recently as November last year, um, he played with Van Morrison um, in uh, London. As, as Hazel said to me, music was his life. Music was his medicine. Crawford Bell will be missed by many people. A large number of people gathered here today indicates that. He will be missed by many people. He will be missed from many circles. But he will, of course, be missed most of all by his own family circle. He never forgot the original family in which he grew up. He enjoyed family reunions and loved to have a sing-song around the piano with his older brothers, Jim and Sloan and Gordon. Crawford married Hazel on the 8th of October 1968 in St. John's Church of Ireland, church in Dramara. And with the passing of time, two sons were born, namely Owen and Warren, from whom we have already heard. Crawford and Hazel made a good team. They complemented each other in so many ways. While Crawford would be away at many engagements, Hazel kept the home fires burning and saw that everything was as it should be in the house. Crawford was a good father to Owen and to Warren. He gave them a father's love and guidance, and he was proud of them. Warren told me a story when I was visiting the family circle after Crawford's death. Warren told me a story um, about his young days, or younger days. He's not all that old really yet, but a story from his younger days. He had, Warren had gone into an event in Belfast. And at the end of the evening, he phoned his dad up and asked, would he come and collect him? Because it was past the time when buses were running to bring anybody home. So he phoned his dad up and asked, would he come and collect him? And of course, Crawford agreed. And Crawford drove down into Belfast and parked outside the venue and waited a while. Lots of young folk came, lots of young folk came streaming out of the establishment. And a couple of complete randomers came out and jumped into the back of Crawford's car. After another little while, Warren himself came out and got into the passenger's seat. And then Warren noticed um, these other people in the back seat, and he said, who are these guys? And Crawford replied, oh, they think this is a taxi and that I'm the taxi man. But sure, I'll run them home anyway. And I think that story probably well reflects Crawford's relaxed and generous personality, both to his own family and to others as well. Crawford, of course, also delighted in his grandchildren, Sophia, Caitlin, Grace, and Elliot. He loved them and poured out his love and energy upon them too. I want to pay tribute to you, Hazel, for all the love that you gave to Crawford, both in health and in sickness. It was good that he was able to finish his days at home as he wanted to, surrounded by the kindness of his own family and others. Hazel would like to thank Linda, Jolene, and Robert for all their love and support and for all the big hugs from the wonderful nurses who cared for Crawford. 
So for myself also, and on behalf of Carrie Presbyterian Church, I want to convey our condolences to you, Hazel, to Owen, and to Warren, and to the grandchildren that we've just mentioned, as well as to his surviving brother, Sloan. And I pray that the God of all comfort may console all of you at this time, and may even this visitation of God's providence draw all of you ever closer to each other. Many of you gathered here this afternoon have probably known Crawford Bell for a long time. I have known him since 1996 when I first became minister of this congregation. He always gave me a warm welcome to his home. I found him to be an interesting conversationalist. He was easy to talk to. And he helped us out musically speaking here in the church from time to time. I have here with me in the pulpit today a CD of Christian songs sung in yesteryear by our children's choir, a girls' brigade choir, and church choir. And yes, you've guessed it, it was produced by Crawford Bell Studios. I remember the conscientiousness and the diligence with which Crawford presided over that single production. And of course, that is but one amongst many that he would have been involved with. From time to time, he also sang at our Wednesday afternoon fellowship. Um, his gentle and relaxed style went down a treat. And when he would ask, as he invariably did, he would sing a selection of his own choosing. And then there would always come a point when he would say, are there any special requests? And there was always a chorus immediately, yes, Jesus, sing us Jesus, the old lamp lighter that we heard in the service earlier this afternoon. I remember visiting Crawford at various stages during his battle with cancer from 2011 onwards. I sensed that he was a man with an interest in spiritual things. Over recent years, he became more regular in his attendance at our church services. And a little while back, after one such service, I said to him, Crawford, are you a Christian? And I distinctly remember his answer. He said, well, I'm not a born again Christian. That was what he said to me. And we talked a little more that day. And then I said to him, well, you know where I am if you want to discuss this any further. And he said, thank you. He said, I'll bear that in mind. I got a phone call from Hazel on the evening of Good Friday, 29th of March this year. Good Friday, what a significant day in the Christian calendar. A phone call from Hazel to say that uh, Crawford was critically ill, but that he seemed to lack a sense of peace. So I went to see him on the Saturday morning. And I knew from his condition that he couldn't bear a long conversation. I congratulated him on having been awarded the MBE. And he said to me, that's not the most important thing now. That's not the most important thing now. He wasn't minimizing the fact that he, in a sense, well deserved the MBE, but he said, that's not the most important thing now. And I said to him, I reminded him of this conversation that I had with him after a church service some time ago. 
I said, do you remember saying to me, I'm not a born-again Christian? He said, yes, I, I do remember that. And then I said to him, Crawford, do you believe in God? He said, I do. I asked him, do you believe that Jesus died for sinners? He said, I do. I asked him, do you believe that you are like me and like all of us a sinner? He said, I do. And I said to him, in that case, do you believe that Jesus died for you? And he said, I do. And I said to him, well, has there been a time then when you asked the Lord Jesus into your heart and life? And he replied, yes, there was. But I didn't feel any different. So I reminded him of that lovely verse, which is one of my own favorite verses from John, or from Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. For the Lord Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him, dine with him, and he with me. And I said to him, Crawford, if you sincerely invited Christ in, then he gives this promise, I will come in. Because we're not to rely, initially at least, we're not to rely on our feelings. Our feelings come and go. Our feelings somewhat ebb and flow. It's not, our faith is not to be in our feelings, but in the sure promises of God's word. And I said, Crawford, many times you've sung about Jesus being the old lamp lighter. And if you have trusted in him, then he will show you the way, because he is the way. I am the way, said Jesus, the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And as best he was able, because I sensed already the conversation was maybe getting too long for him, but we discussed it that little bit more. And I believe that before I left him, he had that blessed assurance in his heart and in his soul that he was right with God and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. He had committed his way unto the old lamp lighter. And what he had sung so often with his lips had become a saving reality in his heart. And so for a few minutes, in this service of thanksgiving for his life, I want to turn your thoughts to those verses that we read earlier, heard earlier, from John chapter 8, verse 12, and also in the book of the Revelation, chapter 21. In John 8 and verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And there are three things I want you to notice in that verse. The first is this. Without Jesus in our hearts, we are in the darkness. You would never dream of going out in your car at night without the lights on. It would be idiotic to do so. You would come a cropper. Your car might well end up crumpled and your body mangled. And yet there are many today st stumbling along life's way. They are in the darkness. There are many people in today's world who think they are nice people because they don't rob banks and don't commit other serious crimes. And humanly speaking, they are nice people. They are nice people. But 
that when we compare ourselves, when we look at ourselves in the light of God's word, then we all realize, in fact, that we're flawed people because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all on level ground when it comes to that. Without Jesus in our hearts, we are in the darkness. And without Jesus in our hearts, we are heading for the outer darkness hereafter. But then secondly, since we are in the darkness, we need to start following Jesus, who is the light of the world. Follow Jesus. He will save you from your sins, save you from straying, and save you from stumbling into the outer darkness. Such was the love of God that he gave the best he had, his only begotten son. Such was the love of Jesus that in obedience to his father's will, he left the realms of glory and came down into this sin scarred world. And he went all the way to the cross. That's what we've been celebrating and remembering recently. How Jesus died on that old rugged cross where he bore your sin and shame and mine and took the penalty we deserved so that we might be saved. Saved from our sin and saved from the darkness of hell hereafter. The question is, question is, which you can only answer for yourself, have you started to follow Jesus, the light of the world? An old Chinese philosopher once said, a journey of a thousand miles begins with a first step, a single step. Have you decisively and personally taken that first step yourself of surrendering to Christ, repenting of your sin, receiving Christ as your Savior. If you have, then praise God. Praise God that he has revealed himself to you and drawn you to himself. And if you have, then day by day keep on following him. Jesus is the old lamp lighter Lighting my path through the darkest night. Jesus is the old lamp lighter. Keeping my pathway bright. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. And then thirdly, whoever trusts in Jesus, whoever follows him will be led to the light and the glory of heaven. In the passage that was read earlier from the book of the Revelation, chapter 21, describing the new Jerusalem, the writer says of that place, the city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives it light, and the Lamb is its lamp. The Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus, the Lamb is its light. The old lamp lighter is the one who sheds his light in the glory of heaven hereafter. Those who trust savingly in the Lord Jesus have the blessed assurance that when they come to the end of life's journey, they will be with him in that land that is fairer than day. They will have the light of life now and the light of glory forever after. But let us be under no misapprehension. Not everyone will go there. Because we are told in the book of the Revelation, chapter 21 and verse 27, nothing impure will ever enter it, nor will anyone who does what is shameful or deceitful but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book 
of life. Those who stay in the darkness and reject Christ and who turn their backs upon him to the very end and who die in the darkness go to the outer darkness and they will have nobody to blame but themselves. On the other hand, those who receive Christ as Savior and walk in the light, they go to the light of eternal life. I don't know all that many of you here this afternoon. You have to examine your own heart and your own life to see whether you have taken that same step that Crawford Bell ultimately did and committed your way. Have you committed your way unto Christ? Do you want to see Crawford again? Do you want to hear Crawford again? Do you want to see Jesus? Do you want to hear Jesus? Do you want to join in the chorus of the redeemed? Then trust in Jesus now. Don't leave it until the last minute. And don't dare leave it until it's too late. When the darkness gathers round me, fears increase at the end of day. Jesus will light the path before me. Softly to him, I'll pray. Have you ever sincerely prayed, let my sins be all forgiven? Bless the friends I love so well. Take me when I die to heaven. Happy there with thee to dwell. Have you? Even this service today, as we give thanks for Crawford's life and all that was good in it, and we thank God that he had closed in with God's offer of mercy in Christ, this could be a decisive day for you too if you come to the Lord Jesus. He bids you come. He says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. May that be true of you. Amen. Let's bow together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, once more we bow our hearts before the majesty of your presence, and once more we seek your face in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for every glad remembrance that we have of our loved one, our friend, our colleague, Crawford Bell. Thank you, O oh God, for the 80 years of life that you granted to him and for the personality with which you blessed him. Thank you, Lord, for the gifts of head and heart and hand that he possessed. Lord God, we thank you that he was a talented man, that he was a wonderful singer, that he was an excellent musician, that he brought joy and blessing to many by using the talents that he possessed. Heavenly Father, we thank you that he was an obliging man, that he would never see anyone stuck, that he would go out of his way to be helpful. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all those things that were good in his life. And we thank you that he used his life to bless other people. Heavenly Father, we also thank you for all the memories of him as a family man. Thank you for the long marriage that Crawford and Hazel enjoyed together. Thank you that they complemented each other in so many ways. Lord, we return our thanks to you that Hazel was able to care for him during these 
latter years as his health began to deteriorate. And we thank you, O God, that he was able to finish the journey of life in his own home, surrounded by his own family circle. And Lord, while the rest of us will miss him somewhat, the family will miss him most of all. And so we bear them up to you in the arms of our faith this afternoon. And we pray, O oh God, that you would surround them with a sense of your presence and fill their hearts with your peace, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding. Heavenly Father, in the midst of their loss, we pray that they may seek the pearl of great price, the Lord Jesus, that all of them too would hear the voice of the Master inviting them to come to him and to follow the one who is the light of the world. So, Lord, we pray your comfort upon Hazel, upon Owen and Warren, upon the grandchildren, Sophia, Caitlin, Grace and Elliot, as well as his brother Slow. We lift them all up to you. We pray, O oh God, that they would turn their face towards you and that you would turn your face towards them and smile upon them with your favour. Give them grace, O oh God, to say, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We pray, O oh God, that they may be able to pick up the threads of life and meet the days to come with steadfastness and courage. And Lord, we thank you for the knowledge that Crawford had come to a sure and saving faith in the Lord Jesus. And Lord, it is that which brings the chief comfort to our hearts today as we look back and remember him and all that he did and all that he meant. We thank you that he was trusting in the shed blood and finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he could say, I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And so as we pray your comfort upon the family circle, we pray, O oh God, that you would speak into all our hearts, reminding us that we are not here to stay, we are here to go, and before that last call comes for us to leave this scene of time, grant that we too may be trusting in the Lord Jesus and find in him all that we need, both for now and for ever. So hear us, Lord, as we raise these our prayers to you. We do so as ever. In Jesus' name. Amen. After the, after the benediction, only the family circle, only the family circle will go to the graveside for the committal. The rest of the congregation are asked to remain here in the church building. And then after the committal has taken place, the family will make their way into the church hall. And at that point, you will be informed and then everyone else can leave the church building to join them in the hall, and you can exit by that door, or by this door, or by the main doors, whichever is handiest to you. Um, the rest of you at that point make your way into the hall. Um, there was a book of condolence in the church vestibule, vestibule um, for you to sign as you came in, if, however, you failed to do that or weren't um, in on time to do that, that book of condolence will be moved out here to the uh, hall for you. And if you didn't sign earlier, then you can do so as you go in for tea. We sing the second hymn, which Crawford had chosen. Abide with me. Fast falls the eventide. The darkness deepens, Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, O oh, abide with me.
Father, we thank you that we've been able to sing the songs of Zion and listen to them being sung. We thank you, Lord, for food for our souls through the reading and preaching of your holy word. And we thank you now for the good things provided for our body's benefit too. And as we further meet and greet each other, as we further reflect upon Crawford's life, we pray that you would also give us thankful hearts for all your blessings to us, and most of all for the unspeakable gift of your dear Son, the Lord Jesus. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest upon us and remain with us this day and until Jesus comes or calls, and then for evermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.